Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. basically just finished the movie like 15 minutes ago i just finished it like 40 minutes ago so that's fine exactly it's very fresh i have not seen it in years and it ages very well (laughs) good 90 minute watch oh yeah definitely all right alex you want to bring us in yes all right hello and welcome to another episode of masters of carpentry my name is alex to my immediate left is julia hey guys and somewhere off in sunny minnesota is noel Frozen Minnesota. It snowed today. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually cold here, too, but no snow, thankfully. A couple introductory things I wanted to mention is our show's been plugged. Oh, really? Anglo Fees, one of the other Made to Fail podcasts, gave us a shout out on one of their episodes, so we wanted to tell everyone to check them out at anglofees.madeafail.net. I will put a link in the show notes. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, guys. And we're returning the favor. Please go check out Anglo Feast. It's a great geek podcast. Kind of covers all the bases of geek culture. Really well done. It's kind of geek culture from a feminist perspective. It's a very interesting show. I've been on it. You have? I've embarrassed myself on it. (laughs) I'm certain that's not the case. I remember you did the fairy tale episode, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Once upon a time in the Tenth Kingdom, I believe, we were mainly covering. They're all very smart, so I usually don't know what they're talking about. They're very, oh, yeah. very, they know their stuff. <laughs> very fun, very insightful show. It's one of my favorite podcasts currently. There you go. I also want to give a shout out to Benjamin J, who gave us a great piece of banner art. He's just a great part of the Made Fail community where every time someone starts up a new project, he just like suddenly emails them of, hey, I got some art for you. Our site looks amazing and professional thanks to him. So thank you, Benjamin. We really appreciate it. It looks fantastic. Absolutely. I get very excited to show people because yeah. it looks so pretty. It's very nice. Yeah, I'm very proud to show it off. Ready to talk some Carpenter? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what film are we covering today, guys? I believe we're covering the 1976 film Assault on Precinct 13. Why don't you tell us a little about that, Noel? Okay. The film was written and directed by John Carpenter, who also did the score and edited the film under the name John T. Chance. It was an independently financed production that Carpenter had full creative control on. He originally conceived it as a Western, but because the budget was very tight, he decided to set it in the modern day because he could then just shoot it around L.A. where he lived. It was inspired by the Howard Hawks film Rio Bravo, which Hawks later remade as El Dorado, in which the inhabitants of a small sheriff station, excuse me, <coughs> still recovering from bronchitis. <laughs> oh, no problem, no problem. In which the inhabitants of a small sheriff station have to fend off an assault from the family of a prisoner they're holding. John T. Chance was the name of John Wayne's character in that movie, and Lee, the character in this movie, is named after Lee Brackett, who was the writer of Rio Bravo. The film was originally titled The Anderson Alamo, then became The Siege, and Assault on Precinct 13 was slapped on by the film's distributor, despite the setting of the film being Precinct 9 Division 13. Just to go through a few notable names involved in the production, in our past installment we already mentioned Douglas Knapp, the cinematographer, and Tommy Lee Wallace, who's the art director and sound effects supervisor. The assistant editor and script supervisor is Deborah Hill, who would quickly befriend John Carpenter and become a key producer and co-writer throughout the next 10 years of his career. Darwin Johnson, who plays Napoleon, is also going to be up... Uh, I can't talk today. Of no course. <laughs> yeah, so this is what happens when I go a couple days without talking and then suddenly podcast. <laughs> So Darwin Johnson, who plays Napoleon, will also be seeing him in the fog. At the time of the making of this movie, he was John Carpenter's next-door neighbor. Charles Cipher, who plays the Federal Marshal Starker, will also be seeing him in Halloween, Someone's Watching Me, Elvis, The Fog, Escape from New York, and Halloween 2. He kind of became one of the first major recurring actors in John Carpenter's troupe. Nancy Loomis, her real name is Nancy Kyes, plays Julie. We'll also be seeing her in Halloween, The Fog, Halloween 2, and Halloween 3. She was married to Tommy Lee Wallace for several years, and she was also the wardrobe supervisor of Assault on Precinct 13. John J. Fox, the warden, will also see him in Someone's Watching Me. Kim Richards, who plays the little girl Kathy, was the star of the Witch Mountain movies made by Disney. The first one was made before this movie, the second was made after. Her little sister, Kyle Richards, will be seeing her in Halloween. Her other little sister, Kathy, is the mother of Paris Hilton. He's going to let that sit in silence. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) 
And Kim Richards has herself appeared on a few seasons of Real Housewives. Hey. <laughs> Surprisingly, one of the few nice, sane people who's ever appeared on the show. So she didn't laugh long. Right. And she actually had a pretty good career going up to the late 80s. She still pops up and stuff now and then. But she's part of the Hilton Empire, so she doesn't really need to work for a paycheck. That's mm. right. Yep. Frank Doubleday, who plays the white gang leader, will also be seeing him in Escape from New York. The property master, Craig Stearns, became the set decorator of Halloween, the art director on The Fog, and has a long production designing career that goes all the way up to Grimm, which he currently works on. Getting into some obscure credits now, the re-recording mixer Bill Varney also did Escape from New York, Halloween 2, The Thing, Halloween 3, and Starman. He won Oscars for his sound work on Empire Strikes Back and Raiders of the Lost Ark, and was also nominated for Dune and Back to the Future. The special effects supervisor, Richard Albane Jr., also did The Fog. He then became the special effects supervisor of Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. The Lightning. Classic. And I've got one more. The production assistant, Randy Moore, who also plays a gang member, was part of Tommy Lee Wallace's art department. He also worked on Halloween, The Fog, and Halloween 3. He was the art director of Tommy Lee Wallace's Fright Night 2, and continues to this day as an art director on films like Curious Case of Benjamin Button, G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra, Fright Night, and The Avengers. Very nice. That's all I have about people who were involved in the film. It's quite the list, actually. It's this small budget film from the 1970s. Oh, yeah. But the art director of The Avengers was on here. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So, anything else we need to do before we... with We're all sims now. <laughs> I don't know if I trust myself to read the synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can. All right. And then after I'm done talking, you guys get to take over for a few minutes. Sounds good. When a California street gang is gunned down in a police sting, gang leaders assemble and make a blood pact for revenge. They set into the surrounding community looking for easy targets of violence and settle on an ice cream truck driver and a little girl buying a cone, both of whom are gunned down in cold blood. The girl's father chases the killers down, getting his revenge on one of them, and then runs for his life from the rest. The local police precinct station has been decommissioned, and Officer Ethan Bishop has been assigned to supervise what remains of the staff in its final night of operation. Most of the supplies have already been packed up and moved out, so it's just him, another officer, and receptionist Lee and Julie. They're forced to open their doors when a prisoner transport bus has to make an emergency stop, and when the father of the girl runs in, he's followed by a wave of nameless, voiceless gang members who cut the power and phone lines and kill everyone inside but Bishop, the receptionist, and the two inmates, one of whom is a thug named Burton, the other a stoic man named Napoleon Wilson who's at peace with his death sentence and just wants a smoke. Bishop frees and arms the prisoners, and they all do the best they can with limited ammo to hold off wave after wave of gang members, but Julie falls to a bullet in one assault, and when Burton sneaks out of the building to hotwire a car and ride for help, he's taken out by a gang member hiding in the back seat. And it doesn't help that the gang members are cleaning up after each attack, so that when additional forces respond to neighbors calling about the gunfire, all they see is a building they know to be decommissioned. With the final assault, the gang members set fire to the building as they flood in, and our heroes box themselves at the end of a narrow basement hallway, setting a trap which they trigger by detonating an acetylene tank. As police finally respond to the location, the surviving gang members scatter, and at the end of a hallway littered with smoldering corpses, our heroes have survived the night. Napoleon needs to return to custody, but Bishop refuses to slap the cuffs on him until they've left the building together. So, do the two of you recommend this movie? Highly enthusiastically, unequivocally, yes, it is my definition of a perfect film. But enough hyperbole. Julia, what do you feel? Assault on Precinct! Awesome! <laughs> yeah, that pretty much sums it up. That was pretty much Evie's thoughts, too, when we did remakes. <laughs> it's been so long, I don't remember, which I was kind of glad about, because I know you guys did your episode and Kevin was on there, our boss, but I barely remember the episode and the movie, so it was really nice to see it again. Noel, what did you think? I said this a couple years ago, and I'll say it again now. This is a fantastic movie. And this is probably the first pure John Carpenter movie we've gotten to. Because Resurrection of Bronco Billy was kind of a bunch of people, and Dark Star was, I would almost say, more Dan O'Bannon than it was John Carpenter. And this one, it's got the style, it's got the mood, it's got the humor, it's got the characters, it's got the way it's written, the music, everything. It is a pure mission statement of what John Carpenter will be. It is lean and mean. It is out for blood. There is no fat on this movie. It is just like, this is what's going on. This is the situation we're in. Let's see what happens. I love it. 
You know when you're like, you have nothing to do and you turn on the TV late at night and you're like, maybe I'll catch a movie. You know, like back when you used to watch TV and catch movies. This is the kind of movie that I always dreamed I would be able to watch. You know, where you're just like, this is the greatest discovery of all time and I'm having an amazing time. Oh, yeah. You know, like, oh, a mom for Christmas or something like that or some horrible Hallmark thing. Yeah. A movie you've watched a million times that's edited to crap. But this is the dream. <laughs> yeah, it's a movie that's super cool. No one's heard of it. It's all yours late at night, and it just blows you away. It's perfect. I love it. I would say all the right people have heard of it. Yeah, that's true. And all the wrong people don't even know it exists. Exactly. <laughs> that means it's ours. It's true. Yeah, I mean, I this is probably going to be the eighth or ninth time I've seen the movie. I mean, I watched it a couple of times a couple of years ago when we did it for remakes. I watched it twice here in the last month, and every single time, I, I just, I'd never get bored of this movie what I love about Carpenter's style is he does draw things out. Mm -hmm. There is a very gradual build to every sequence, to every scene, and yet it never gets boring. It's just, it holds me so tight. It's like a kettle, kind of. It just slowly builds and builds. Yes. Everything comes to a head at the end. I mean, I watch the clock. It's 40 minutes before the assault actually begins on the police station. And by then, we're at the halfway point of the movie. I noticed that. And by the time, like, things actually really kick in, where they're just trying to figure out what's going on, I'm like, there's 22 minutes in this film left. And I appreciate that. <laughs> Like, it doesn't give you a chance to get bored of any sort of situation that they're in. Where they do that thing where they have the first plan, and you know there's, you know, an hour left. So that plan's not going to work out. So you just have to wait for that plan not to work out, and then for the actual real plan at the end of the movie to happen. Mm. That happens in, like, longer length pictures where there's some sort of situation like this where they have to get out of it. I can't believe that it didn't work out and the car didn't start. Oh, wait, I've just seen the actual plan, and it's over here in storage yeah. room B. <laughs> yeah. We go. What I love is that it actually then will suddenly a lot will happen in a short amount of time, and then we're waiting and then a lot will happen, and then we're waiting. Because those long stretches not only allow us to build tension, but they also let us catch our breaths and fully process what all just happened. I mean, there's that great bit where after the entire police station has been shot to hell, the guy checks his watch and he says, everything that just happened just happened in 30 minutes. And I watched the clock. It was 25 minutes of film that we just watched by that point. It's pretty awesome. It's like a checklist. I'm like, this is actually what would happen. And that's actually what I would do. Like, it all works perfectly. I didn't yell at anybody at any point. You know, when you're like watching a movie, you're like, what? Oh, what yeah. are you doing? No, oh, like that would never happen or anything like that. All the way. I'm like, yes, yes, that would happen. Yes. <laughs> and even important things like, you know, the acetylene tank and the magnesium flares are just set up in just such quick little forgettable ways that just feel perfectly natural. Yeah, where you're just like, well, we'll catch that later. I mean, if you stop and think about it, it's why are they collecting acetylene tanks as evidence? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it just, the film breezes by it so quick that by the time you get back to it, you're just accepting that, oh, that's right, they had that there. I accepted a lot of things. I don't ask for much in movies. I just ask for a brief explanation that says that you care about why this is happening. Yeah. And I'll take it. Like, why wouldn't there be acetylene tanks in a police station? Come on, it's evidence. <laughs> what I love is when he pulls out the crate that has the shotgun and the rifle in it. He also pulls out a box of magnesium flares and they say, but we don't have a flare gun. And it's like, okay. Yeah, absolutely. One, that instantly nixes off why don't they use the flares. And second, that sets up the flares for the future. Mm -hmm. They really do cover all their bases in that, why the radio's not working, why they can't get help, they have silencers, could be fireworks. When they finally start using a service revolver, everything makes total sense. Yeah, like the criminals thought of everything, the police thought of everything, John Carpenter when he was writing it thought of everything that made mm -hmm. sense, because even Ali was saying that why the people at the end of the block, even if their phone hadn't been cut off, why they didn't alert the police. And I'm like, if they were in this kind of bad neighborhood, they would stay in their house and wait yeah. for it to blow over. And yet we find out that people have been alerting the police because they have been hearing the gunfire. Yeah, exactly. But because it's such an isolated location, none of the neighbors can tell where the gunfire is coming from. Something, but we don't know where. So it's just this one car of cops just driving around because backup is all tied up elsewhere. Just driving around trying to figure out where the hell everyone's hearing things from. <laughs> and I totally buy it. Like, I totally buy why they breeze by it. It's just an old precinct. It's shut down. He starts getting the bad feeling. I was a little off on that. But then I'm just like, you know what? Sometimes you have a bad feeling. Like, when he comes back the second time. And I love then that he pulls in right where we just saw the car go out when they killed, what's his name? Wells, I think. Wells, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They come in right over the manhole cover. Yeah, which the fact that they're, like, all the evidence whenever something bad happens just disappears. It's so creepy. It's like they're resetting a stage. And it also makes sense that, you know, that's an area that our heroes had full view of, but they don't see it because they're setting up in the basement. Exactly, yep. 
which makes sense because when the first attack happens, the people coming out the back don't see it. So everything makes sense. You know exactly where everything is. You know, the setup makes sense. It's just wonderful. <laughs> I mean, and they even said that, you know, what's in back of the building is just a wall with barbed wire on top. And the only way in and out is the front. Which leads right back to the killing zone. <laughs> exactly. And all the people who park their cars park it across the street, and the villains go ahead and make use of those, too. Exactly. Yeah, the villains are very smart for a faceless army of the night. <laughs> yeah, I like how, I don't know, it's almost like the new youth of America are the bad guys. It's true. They even specifically point them out as the young. Yeah, which is kind of like a sign of the times back then, where everyone was just afraid of youth and gang culture and numbers. They were scared of people overwhelming them for everything. Like, there's going to be more of them than there is of us. Yeah, I mean, because this was very much the same period that gave us Death Wish, that gave us the Warriors. Absolutely. Fear of urban youth culture, essentially. And just that they are, well, I mean, except for I think there's like one line where they say, for the six. Yeah. They have no names. They have no expression. They have no reactions. They're just bloodthirsty. This is our territory. I don't care what we did to you. You don't do anything to us. Exactly. Which I appreciated on one level. I was a little wary at first because back in the 80s, things kind of got into racist territories as well, where they were afraid of people of different races and cultures. But I think that it was a good balance because everyone, there was like different mixed radio. Yeah, they actually make a point of when he's listening to the car radio and they mention the gang Street Thunder. They say one of the odd makeups of the gang is that it's a multiracial gang. Which I appreciated as well. And our four main leaders, you have a Latino guy, a white guy, a black guy, and an Asian guy. Absolutely, yeah. And it's the same with the protagonists as well. Our protagonist is a 30-something black police officer, which I loved. Yeah, I like how, you know, you could almost argue Wells is kind of the stereotypical black guy in movies. You know, he's the thug who's calling the cops pigs and all that stuff. And, but he's counterpointed by Ethan Bishop, who I, I love the backstory of Ethan Bishop, who they ask him, so who was it who was smart enough to get you out of this neighborhood before you could grow up into the violence? And he's like, no one got me out of it. I walked out myself when I was an adult. There's two characters who I am infatuated with. One is Ethan Bishop, who is the do-gooder straight man, but done perfectly. Mm -hmm. Like, most do-gooder straight men are super boring. He is, oh, it's just so good. I love how he has moments where he gets exasperated. Yes, he loses his cool, his actions make sense, he's funny, like genuinely funny, he has good rapport with everyone, they don't give him a romantic lead, which I really loved, he's just there to do his job. And it's he is on point all the time, too, yeah. like, he knows he's the one who has to make the decisions, he has to be the leader, he's in charge. Yeah. And so when you see him getting exasperated, it's actually a nice relief, mm -hmm. because he's not this, like, crazy superhero stoic man who can take care of everything, but he's an actual person. That's trying to solve each problem as it comes up. And you can see he doesn't want to do it, but he's going no. to do it because it's his duty. <laughs> yeah. Because he, he takes to. his job seriously. Mm -hmm. It's so good. And I know what your next character is. And that's Leah. And she's amazing. And I want to be her for Halloween because she's a shit. <laughs> she might be the greatest character I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> We're really excited about her right now. For a film made in the 70s, she has a fantastic female character. She is Fantastic. so great. Fantastic. She's so cool. She's a badass. She's realistic. She's stoic. The scene where she gives Napoleon a smoke. I so wish, badass. I wish I could just have like a moment like that once in my life. <laughs> I'll take it because it's amazing. And she gets it several times. I mean, she had that. She had the great scene where she stares down Wells, who's got a gun on her. Mm -hmm. Yep. She's got that 10-yard stare. She fights off the guys when she gets shot. Yeah. Yeah, she gets shot and she just stands there, waits for them to come close, and then belts them with the keys. Exactly. Amazing. And then she knows exactly what to do. Like, they free the guys. Yeah. Then it's never like they need each other to save each other. They're just like, this is the situation. I'm going to need you as backup, so you're going to be released. Like, it, oh, She's a true sense. member of the team. Yeah, she is a true member if not, of the team. An amazing person. She's the leader. She is every bit as badass as Napoleon and Ethan, but does it in heels with a dead arm. Yeah, and I love that her arm is dead because usually when people get shot in the arm, their arm is fully functional, except it's got a little red paint on it. Yeah. With this, she her arm does not move for the rest of the movie. And describe the scene with the cigarette because it's amazing. Oh, does he ask for the cigarette or does Well, yeah. yeah, it's a recurring joke throughout the film that every time he meets someone, he's like, he got to smoke. And it's almost like that's his test of people just to see how they'll react. Because he's got that great bit where he asks it of Ethan and Ethan says, no, I don't. I'm sorry. And he's like, a cop never apologized to me before. <laughs> yeah. And then he gets to her and she just pulls out a cigarette, pulls out a matchbook and just with one thumb lights the match from the matchbook. 
And she, like, never breaks eye contact with him either. Their dialogue is, like, they communicate with their eyes, those two, which I, I was... She just had a great stare. Yeah, she did. Absolutely. I can't... I'm... I love her. <laughs> We're kind of in love with her. Sadly, Lori Zimmer, this was her only big role. She did a couple of roles after this, but she kind of couldn't stand watching herself on screen. Oh, really? Yeah, John Carpenter would, like, bring her into daily. She would hate it, and he'd be like, no, no, you're fantastic. You're doing a wonderful job. And so she just quit acting. And so this is kind of like... This is it when it comes to Lori Zimmer's acting career. Now well, she's too badass. For Honestly, the, uh, it's enough. Yeah, I think I'll she. Take it. Yeah, <laughs> it is. This is a perfect signature role. Yeah. Yep. And she's out. Drops <laughs> Mike. Walks away. <laughs> and she shows that Velma has great fashion sense. I know she does. Look- you almost think Velma is cosplaying as Lee. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like next year I'm totally, that's it. We're yeah. done. Well, that's happening. It's amazing. It's I, a fantastic house costume. And then I was like, everyone's going to think that I'm Velma. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But you know, I'll be like, I'm not wearing glasses and I have blood on my arm. That's true. I'm an obscure character you've never heard of. But then when someone knows who you are, then you know you have a friend for life. That's right. It's like a litmus test for new friendships. It's true. Does this Cholo thing exist in real life? Is that actually a thing, or did they just make that up for the movie? I should have researched that a little bit, because I've never... I don't have a clue, actually. It was very much like, are these guys, like, into witchcraft or something at the beginning? I thought that was funny that they put their blood in a bowl, and they just throw their blood. <laughs> like, were they intentionally saving it in case that guy got into a building or something? <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. When they started doing that, I'm like, what are they, 10? What's yeah. going on here, Blood Brothers? Yeah. <laughs> now I'm looking it up, and all that I can really see are things referring to the movie. So. All right, so the Cholo does not exist. It just means they don't care. <laughs> yeah. It was just a neat visual for them to come up with for the film. And what was written on the fabric? I think it's a cholo. Is yeah, it said cholo. Yeah, which was amazing. I'd like to actually see a scene of them making their banner. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> do, 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 do. Yeah. One of the interesting things is it's only on that radio that we ever hear that they're a gang called Street Thunder. Which I think I even missed, too. One of my theories, and I expressed this two years ago, is I don't think that's what the original intention was. I almost suspect that what it's supposed to be is that all of the various gangs are coming together. Oh, it makes sense because the way they do it is like, that's a mega gang. Like, there's no way that there's a gang that big. Exactly. And that's my theory. And I'm thinking somewhere in the transition that they weren't able to express that. And so they just slipped in the one dialogue thing to explain it as best they could. Okay. Yeah. Because it just feels like the gang is tired of the police cracking down on them. So all the gangs are getting together. Because that's like the plot of the Warriors as well. They're afraid that they're going to make one huge gang and overrun the police. Like, if that's what would happen, if basically they all teamed up together. So I could see that for sure. I mean, my only complaint is, like, they say we're going to take this entire place back. And we never really see that. It's just they go after the one guy and then go after the police station. That's kind of it. Yeah, I guess they kind of had to have that balance of, like... There's the tight budget, I know. Uh, but, I mean, like, there's just that weird scene where they're driving down the street with the sniper rifle looking at people to go after, and then they just decide, we're going to harass the ice cream truck. Yeah, I thought that was going to come to something. Yeah. Like he was an enemy of some kind, that he had done something wrong, had snitched, you know, had taken money and not given back something, you know. Something because when he's driving for. with his daughter and she says to ask directions to the policeman, he's like, uh, no, we're not doing that. No, so ice I- cream man. Why did the ice cream man get killed? The oh. daughter got killed just because she was there. Oh, oh. That's what I like is that this film, there's so much detail there without actually really telling you much. Mm -hmm. And like the whole thing with the father and his daughter, they're from the suburbs. They're a clean cut family from the suburbs. Yeah, he's obviously got some concerns around the police. You have to remember that this was also a time of police brutality in the news. And so he was might have been worried about that. I think he had done something. He was running from the law or he had trouble before. He was very concerned. He was acting like Janet Lee in Psycho. <laughs> there was, but if you look at really what the most of the story is, is he's just coming in to take the nanny who raised the girl back to live at their home in the suburbs so she doesn't have to be stuck in this neighborhood. Okay. It actually took me like four watchings before I actually got that that's what they were talking about. <laughs> I thought they were talking about their grandmother. I thought he was going to go get nanny. That's the word we use for grandmother in my family is nanny. Okay. It's either the nanny or it's the mother on the mom's side because he always refers to her by name. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. I don't know. I don't know. He looked shady to me. He did look a little shady. (laughs) Well, I think, yeah, he has some concerns around the police, but I don't think it had anything to do with the gangs because he's not from this neighborhood because he doesn't know how to drive around it. Yeah. So it makes sense that they would just be like this isolated incident that ticked off this gang and then it kind of goes into there. It's it's crazy that they killed the kid, though. (laughs) Yeah, because as I said, the original film Rio Bravo, what happened was they arrest a guy whose father owns, you know, all the local posses. And so the father and all the local posses attack the police, the sheriff's station to get his son back. So, I mean, the original concept for this film was the gang members were going to be Apaches. Okay. 
and that it was going to be, you know, they attacked the ranch and someone killed some of them and then they come back. For I'm kind of glad they didn't because it's, you know. Yeah, I like this better as what it is. Like, I prefer this better as like an inner city kind of. Uh, yeah. It works better. I don't think I would like it as much as a Western. But I mean, in terms of the characterization, I mean, yeah, there's the ice cream truck driver who is terrified. But then if you think about it, it's just because he lives in the neighborhood he lives in. Yeah. Well, that car's going back and forth. Yeah. I would be scared. He's too. probably been held up before. He's probably been attacked before. That's why he's got the gun. There's stuff like, you know, Bishop's backstory as a child and raising up and getting out here. And this is his first command as a commanding officer. He had only just been promoted. And they're sending him out here as his first assignment. Then uh, Napoleon, we always get this tease of he'll tell us how he got his name, but he never tells us. We never entirely know what his crime was. We know he killed some people, but we don't know why. We know he's on death row and that's about it. We don't need to know, man. It's perfect the way it is. And I don't think any story that he told about his name would be good to live up to it. I mean, even like Ethan Bishop talks about, you know, when he came in and carved something on the desk and he points to it, they look at it, but we never see it. Yeah, exactly. I like that as well. Carpenter knows how to give you all the details while still leaving things to the imagination. Very minimalist. I laughed out loud probably for a, like the longest time I have in a while at the joke that Lee and he has where she asks him how he takes his coffee. I had a snort. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Black? For 34 years now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's like, yeah. such a silly thing to say. It's very affectionately silly. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. There were a lot of great lines here. Like when she tells Napoleon that she's been friends with police for the last five years, he's like, well, that's enough to grow hair on a rock. <laughs> <laughs> I think every joke and every love one-liner worked for me, starting with, <laughs> I knew we were in good hands when one of the first lines was a bus load of hate. <laughs> and I'm just yeah. like, that is some noir writing right there. I like that. The only joke I didn't understand was chicken night and turkey. What does that even mean? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> it's a pun because you're in Turkey and it's chicken night. I guess so. <laughs> Bit of a stretch, but at least it's a character that we didn't like. It was funny listening to the audio commentary where Carpenter's like, on the one hand, I had never really written much film dialogue before. <laughs> and on the other hand, though, it's just got such a raw charm to it that I can't be embarrassed by it. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's definitely a young director storming out of the gate. He's just like, I'm going to kill a kid. Everything's going to happen. I'm not going to tell you anything. It's my vision. It was a very refreshing commentary where a lot of it was, you know, I wouldn't make this film the same way I did when I was at that age, but that's not a bad thing. Exactly. No, yeah, it's full of piss and vinegar, and I don't think you should change it. It's just so raw. And like even the most controversial element of the film, the shooting of the young girl, that's something he says, I couldn't do that nowadays. I'm a father, I can't do that nowadays, but I'm glad I did when I could. Absolutely, because <laughs> if I would made a film back in my early 20s, I would have been fine with that. I've been like, whatever, this is hardcore. Nowadays, no way. <laughs> well, you know that I'm completely useless. Yeah. Ever, like, ever since we had the baby. Whereas, like, before I was like, Tarantino's the greatest. Yeah, cut his ear off. Let me see some blood. I'm the coolest chick ever. And then that graduated into, no, oh, I mean, I like most movies. I'm cool with it. But I'm not crazy about torture, porn, and all that stuff. That's upsetting. And now um, I burst out crying while watching Piranha 3D. <laughs> yep, she was sobbing uncontrollably at Piranha 3D in the theater. <laughs> Those kids just wanted to have a good time. They were. They weren't that bad of kids. They didn't deserve that piranha action. They all had moms and dads that loved them. <laughs> and I was just a giant mess. I was pregnant at the time. <laughs> so I was a little higher emotion than necessary. But even now when I watch stuff, I'm just like, oh, oh, that's someone's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> a useless mess. <laughs> I mean, Jack Carpenter, he is a violent filmmaker, but it's never gratuitous. No. And it's going to be interesting when we get to Halloween 2, where he actually went and shot additional gore shots. But he always has a thoughtful use of violence, and he knows how not to make it so explicit that it becomes unwatchable. I mean, like, it's a very bloody movie with a lot of bloody squibs and all that stuff, but it's never... You don't, like, see anyone's head blow up, you know? You don't see anyone, like, completely ripped apart by bullets. Granted, they couldn't afford it, but still. Yeah, it's true. He shows the weight of the actions, too. The father has the proper mourning time for his daughter. He is comatose for the rest of the film, which is exactly what would happen. Yeah. Julie is mourned appropriately by her friend, Lee. I mean, even the officer who is the first one shot at the building, when he walks out and gets shot, it's a great moment where Julie laughs at it because she thinks he tripped. Yeah. And then there's the gradual realization of horror. And although it's not stylized violence is what it is. It's very yeah. realistic. The only thing that was sort of stylized was the people flying at the windows, but that just reminded me of Desperado. <laughs> <laughs> 
And also, even when the one main gang leader gets killed, just the way he goes down is just so creepy, you know? I mean, Carpenter said that the actor literally wanted to play it as a machine. Mm, I could see that. Everything about that gang is creepy. Even the fact, like, when the guy goes through the sewers to go and uh, jumpstart the car, mm-hmm. the way they walk towards him so slowly. Yeah. Something so much more menacing about an enemy that approaches slowly with confidence yeah. than someone just running at you. They don't care, man. Cholo. They also knew someone was sitting in the back seat. Yeah, yeah that's kind of ridiculous. That war part is like, <laughs> really? <believe> that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but it's a great twist. And if you think about how in control they are over the environment, why would they not? Mm-hmm. It's terrifying. It does raise the stakes a lot. I mean, you don't even know if they planted him there just to be there or if he was just waiting until the next assault happened. Yeah, that's very true. Like, he could have been, like, waiting. Yeah, I'm sure they thought of that. Like, eventually they're going to try to get out to the car sitting right there. They could have even put it there as bait. We don't even know if the car was originally there. That's true. Yeah, because they were moving the cars back and forth for sure. What a smart gang. (laughs) How scary. They really get their stuff together. They They do. They had some Excel spreadsheets. If they just applied themselves to anything else, they would would make it. (laughs) And here's the military recruiter who would like to talk to all of them. Exactly, yeah. Am I being funny? They had stolen guns, yes? They got a whole bunch of... Crates of of guns, yeah. Crates of guns. Do they come with bullets? I assume they had bullets. Well, and then also what those gang members were killed at in the opening scene was robbing an armory. Oh, okay. That one was unsuccessful, but I guess they've been doing that all over the place. So they were setting up so the gangs. Like, so like, everything? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and silencers aren't the easiest thing to get a hold of either. No. No, I imagine not. Yeah. The gun that the guy had that he pulled on the ice cream man mm-hmm. was hella scary. Yeah. It was just a weird looking gun. Yeah. I love how a lot of them have these, for no reason, German Lugers. Yeah. And those are, yeah, very frightening <laughs> looking guns. I will say that I thought the fact that, I mean, I don't know that much about John Carpenter, so I guess you guys do, that he did the music for it. I gave it such an excellent edge mm-hmm. because the person that created the characters, directed them, you know, that wrote everything, was able to also set the mood and tone through the music as well, really gave it that something extra. Yeah. And get used to it because you're going to hear a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. That's good because sure. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Even in his last few films, he still does the score. Of uh, being a musician. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's always got that same kind of style to it. Oh, he knows how to, like, sustain a note to build pro- tension. Yes. Yeah. It's like you said, like a tea kettle. He knows how to just give it that nice boil. Absolutely, for sure. I'm a big fan of electronic eerie. Mm-hmm. I like it. Definitely. And he was one of the pioneers of using electronic scores, too. He had a whole music studio set up. He would put everything together himself. Yep. I mean, Nick Castle and Tommy Lee Wallace, who I've mentioned in the past, them and John Carpenter actually had a band. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> even in the 80s, they even got to make some official music videos, and we'll see a few of them. Of course, yeah, I remember the Big Trouble in Little China video. It's yep. pretty righteous. <laughs> and by that time, they were like guys who used to be in a band together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're like meeting up 20 years later. They they look like guys who used to be in a band together. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think of, was it the captain on the radio that he was talking to you before he went to start his ship? Where he said, there are no heroes anymore, just men who follow orders. Yep. Well, he was teasing the captain, and the captain was kind of throwing it right back at him. Yeah. And they gave him a shit assignment as his first assignment. And he followed it. He followed his orders. And yeah. Yeah. I think he'll be running for a commissioner, and then he'll be side by side with the Batman. I think so, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) You're making me do my ugly laugh. Jim Gordon, year one, back when he was black. (laughs) Yeah, back when he was black. Uh... Yeah, I think he's going to get a promotion after that. Unless he retires. <laughs> yeah, maybe I would retire too. Day two, retirement. <laughs> and that's what I also like about the ending is, you know Napoleon's not getting out of his death sentence. You know they're not going to just suddenly like, oh, you helped save the day. Here you go. But the least he can do is give Napoleon the dignity of walking out with him side by side without cuffs on. He stayed. He didn't run. He helped people, possibly for the honor of Lee, but we don't know. It was communicated with their eyes. What I love about Napoleon is there is this slight nobility to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I love that moment where he first gets the gun, shoots the guys, and then suddenly there's that moment there of he realizes he has a gun and the police officer doesn't. And there's just that moment of what's going to happen here. Yeah, for sure. They play it really well. And they just keep going on with the situation. I mean, I love that line that he has with Starker where Starker goes, "I I don't get you. You're not a psychopath and you're not stupid. And he turns to Stark and says, yeah, but I am an asshole. Don't take that away from me, too. (laughs) Yeah, I kind of want to know what he did now. I can't picture him doing anything that bad. I think that's the whole point. Yeah. 
there was that line of he was born out of time. You know, he is almost like he is the old Western gunfighter who's born in an era where you can't be that anymore. Yeah, exactly. Like to take the law into your own hands or to live by your own rules would pretty much get you yeah, on death row. Where it was like- Which again makes you wonder what that story was about the people he killed. Yeah. We need a comic book tie-in. Do you have any information on that? You usually know things like... I have no drafts of this. I don't have any... John Carpenter, I think, he doesn't even know what the details are that he's left out. Oh, fair enough. I think, you know, he just suggests enough and is like, nothing I could come up with would do that justice, so I'm just going to leave it open. He's right. How often does that happen? Yeah. Where you, like, have a movie that you idealize and all that kind of stuff, and you have all these questions about it, and the people that are like, I don't know, this was all we had. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually the way it goes. It usually is. Like, working on there and seeing people scramble to get stuff, where they're just like, we need this now. Uh, I have this thing? Okay. And then that becomes the <laughs> symbolism of the whole picture. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but what's interesting about Napoleon is he's very much the first version of Carpenter's anti-hero. And we'll be getting to these when we get to Snake Plissken in Escape from New York. Snake Plissken is very much an evolution of the Napoleon character. He's very similar, and I believe they cut out his backstory as well, although I think they had it in like a Well, diff- it wasn't so much backstory as just how he got arrested. Right. It was just a bank heist. Yes. And we, we hear it was a bank heist. Oh, okay, okay. There was actually a scene showing it, and they just cut it because it didn't fit the flow of the film. Right. So, I mean, we still don't know his origins, his backstory, what made him a gangster and all that stuff. And mm-hmm. he has that similar sense of he's an asshole, but he's kind of a noble asshole, and you don't want to be on the wrong side of him. Definitely. I mean, as I said in the beginning, this is John Carpenter. If you want to know what John Carpenter is, what his style is, the types of stories and characters he explores, this is John Carpenter. I'm really excited now. Yeah. I almost legitimately think that we are not going to see another John Carpenter film that is as purely concentrated as it is here. It really is just like... Not to say that there aren't films that aren't better than this, but it's just this is so pure. Yeah, from the poster on up. He hasn't been in the industry. He hasn't really developed and honed his style. This is just him putting everything that is him purely on the page before he really refines himself over his career. Yep. And he is incredibly lucky for the opportunity to do so. It's yes. True. Because for someone to be able to do whatever they want and purely their signature on something mm-hmm. is something that a, most people don't get. Nope. And it was literally what happened was some a group of financiers who saw Dark Star and said, here's money, you have carte blanche as long as you don't come in over budget. It's the dream. Yeah. It is. Yeah, I don't even think it was a full million dollars. It might have been a million, but I'm not sure. Yeah, he had complete control over it. I think the only thing that happened was the distributor got to do a few changes, like basically just changing the title, which, as as I said, it was supposed to be The Siege. <laughs> like Assault on Precinct 13, it's very catchy. Yeah, and even he was like, you know, yeah, it doesn't make sense, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Like, that used to happen a lot in movies where they would just change the title and it would actually work. Like, I believe there was a film called Kilobots or Kilobyte, and then they were like, no, that doesn't work. So they changed it to Chopping Mall, and everyone went and saw that instead. (laughs) Oh, God, Chopping Mall. I would go see Chopping Mall over Kilobots. I've seen Chopping Mall. I have seen it, too. It's got one of the best head explosions I've ever seen. Oh, God bless you, Jim Wynorski. (laughs) Another one of my favorite directors, but nowhere near as good as Carpenter. No, Carpenter's the man. (laughs) And then the title, The Anderson Alamo, I get it because it takes place in Anderson, but it's like, that's... It's a little too literal. It's too Western-y, and how many people caught that the place that they're in is called Anderson? Exactly, yeah. I think it's only mentioned a couple times. And he said one of the biggest problems for this was finding locations to shoot because there was a big social program that actually cleaned up a lot of the town, so it didn't look like this kind of sparse, abandoned ghetto. Okay. Even the police station that they filmed, which was an actual abandoned police station that's used a lot back then in TV and movies. So this police station you'll find in a lot of places. The interiors were all a set. But the exterior, he had to be very careful if you could only shoot it from a certain angle. Because if you turn around, it's suburbs and palm trees and all that stuff. And everything like across the street, down the street, all that stuff they had to find elsewhere. There was an interview with Akira Kurosawa once, and they asked him why he made this shot, which was like an amazing shot of samurai walking down a hill. And he said, if I went to the little to the left, you would have seen uh, telephone poles. And if I went a little to the right, you would have seen a parking lot. (laughs) Yep. So it's definitely like that. And then Kurosawa got to the point where he would just build an entire city. Well, yeah. (laughs) He had the luxury. But it definitely feels like that, where they were just kind of shooting around things. He had the luxury until it got to the point where it's like, you've taken a little too much luxury. We're not doing that anymore. (laughs) Yeah. 
you build a whole mountain. I have much to say about Kurosawa, but this is John Carpenter. Yeah, we're going to do Carpenter. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it definitely feels like that to where the camera is very much stuck in certain areas. We're seeing like the opening here, the parking lot here. You only see this part of the trees. I actually really enjoyed that because I felt it represented what they were able to see from inside. Yeah, that's true. Good they point. couldn't really see farther than what they can see out the window. Very good point. It feels like a film where Carpenter really just went out and took stock of what he could get and built something around. Worked within his means. He had a great simple story of, you know, they're stuck in a police station and they can't get out. And that's your basic setup. And it's, okay, what all do I need to make that work? What all can I get that will let me make that work? Mm -hmm, for sure. And those are the resources. I mean, like all of the uh, gang members were all USC students because USC was down the street from where the studio was that they were filming. And he was, you know, the notorious USC guy who stole Dark Star and made a name for himself. So all the students were hero worshiping him. And he's like, hey, you want to come? And they would all just like, OK, you get to jump in a window. Now you get to jump in a window. Now you get to jump in a window. <laughs> and they all just had fun trying to come up with different ways to throw blood on themselves. And Sounds like fun. <laughs> I think at the end, I think the only thing that bothered me about the gang, if they were so cholo about this whole situation, as soon as police show up, they run. They hightail it. <laughs> they should have kept fighting. Well, I mean, half of them ran and the other half blew up in the building. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like because they were so smart and prepared for everything, I feel like it was part of their plan that if the police ever showed up, they were to disappear so that if they had some sort of fight with the police, they're not going to win. Yeah. So they need the manpower to continue. But they don't care. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. They don't care. They do care. Obviously, they have some sort of objective that they care about. Yeah, for self-preservation, you have to care a little bit. <laughs> I think it ultimately makes a statement that they're not boogeymen. They are human. It's true. Yeah. I wonder if there'll be any retaliation. I wonder if there'll Assault be on Precinct 14. Ah, you beat me to it. <laughs> well done. <laughs> One of my only issues is when Starker pulls the bus over and Bishop is telling him, you know, you can't stop here. We don't have the resources. And he's just like, if you go 10 blocks down and Starker cuts him out, it's like, they couldn't go 10 blocks. I actually have that written verbatim down. 10 blocks. You couldn't go 10 blocks. Yeah. I'm like, it's not explosive diarrhea. I think you'll make it. Yeah, I think so. He looked like he just had the flu. Yeah. <laughs> he looked like me last week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I enjoy that I got explosive diarrhea. <laughs> you put it on the podcast, there. it's there it's forever. Important. I even specifically watched for that of like, please tell me they're putting him in a cell that has a toilet. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, there it is. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> he just had the sniffles and he got everybody killed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad Wells got killed because he was sitting next to him. So he was going to get something nasty. That's true. Yep. Oh, uh, Wells, I, I didn't mention him earlier, but the actor Tony Burton who plays him, you might have seen him. He's one of the few actors who's in all six Rocky movies. He was the trainer of Apollo Creed, who then became Rocky's trainer after Mick died. Oh! So he's a rather prominent character in the Rocky series, and he's a character actor who pops up in a lot of stuff. Nice, I'll have to rewatch that. He was great. I loved all his joking asides and stuff like that. And oh, when he was, when they were talking about who was going to go down to the cellar, and he's, we should flip a coin for him, and he's like, shit, shit, shit. <laughs> he's like, well, I always lose. One of my favorite things is, is no one going to wish me good luck and just cut to them deadpan. Good yeah. luck. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> How do you like that? Two cops wishing me luck. What was the game that they were playing? I've never heard of potatoes? that game before. I played a version of that when I was a kid, like one potato, two potato, three potato, four. I've never, that was a very deluxe yeah. version. <laughs> was how, like how do you win? Whoever's at the end, I think. Oh. But then people keep adding stuff on and then like, your potato's great. They, and they said this was their own version that they kind of improvised. Yeah. <laughs> I liked it. I appreciated that a little. There were so many little details that I loved. I loved at one point when Napoleon's blasting people, he burns himself on the barrel of his gun. Oh, I haven't caught that. Yeah, it was great. I'm just like, I like that little detail. Like, obviously, Lee with her arm. Just so many little things like that. <laughs> Darwin Johnston, who played Napoleon, sadly, he also never really went on to have much of an act. I mean, he popped up in some stuff here and there, but he then became a driving coordinator, coordinating vehicles to drive people to and from sets and all that stuff, because he just loved driving. They call cool. them captains. Captains? Nice. Yeah. Yep. He's since passed away, but yeah, he just kind of gradually fell out of acting, but he always hung around the sets and everyone knew him. That's cool. He's very 70s guy. I can't see him making it too far to the 70s unless he got like picked up by Tarantino like Robert Forster. <laughs> And that's the thing is most of the actors in this, I couldn't really see many of them going on to A-list productions with a few exceptions, but man, do they work so well here. Oh, so well. Yeah. I mean, like Austin Stoker, who played Ethan Bishop, he's a character actor who's popped up in TV throughout the 70s and 80s and 90s still today. You know, Lori Zimmer, would she have had a massive career if she had kept acting? 
She would have been on TV, probably. I mean, I think she would have had a career, but this was just such a perfectly crafted character that just fit her so well. Yeah, I think just like that turtleneck. That's right. (laughs) Damn girl. You made a turtleneck sexy. Way to go. And Charles Cipher, who plays Starker, you know, he's perfect for the role, but he's never really going to... He's not even really a recognizable face. Yeah. Even though we're probably going to recognize him by the time we get to his eighth Carpenter film. (laughs) (laughs) Was that the fellow that was on the bus? The federal marshal, yeah. 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 As soon as he walked in, he he walked into the police station, and I just had this thing wash over where I'm like, God, I miss sideburns. (laughs) No, like <laughs> he wore them well. Good old he did. Seventies hardcore side bits. Yeah, I need some more of it in my life. It's true. <laughs> I'll grow some for you. Yeah, thank you. No problem. I'm on it. <laughs> just wish it was more acceptable up there, you know. And I even love just little moments like the warden messing with Napoleon just for the hell of it, and Starker kind of be like, "I'm not someone who does that." Mm-hmm. I like that there is some amount of respect. Mm-hmm. Napoleon almost has that Hannibal Lecter quality of if you show him respect, he'll show you respect. It's true, yeah. If you don't show him respect, he's going to get you. Yep. He won't eat you, but... <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to steal Hannibal's thunder. <laughs> Anything else we want to bring up about the film? I'm just checking through my notes right now. Did you guys enjoy hearing the disco version of the theme? Very much so. Very much so. It was awesome. This guy, I'm actually going to put it in my iPod. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think I've covered pretty much everything I want to in my notes. I have, I don't know, it's probably just because there's a lot of things that are just me. But you know how all of the gang members were driving around in the car looking for people to shoot and stuff? Mm, Yep. Mm -hmm. Is there something funny about four men in a car? I just find it a little silly. (laughs) That, you know, two of them have to get in the back seat. And they have their legs all crunched up. It's just, I think maybe it's more like businessmen when you think of four men in suits, you know, looking sharp, and then two of them have to crawl into the back of a Mazda. There is a definite bit of absurdity. I mean, just that great wide shot getting in all four of them in the car as they're just sitting there, not talking, and suddenly they got guns and they got silencers. When they were, like, looking around for people to shoot and his little sniper sight, like, looking at people. It's creepy, but it's also kind of absurdist. Yeah. Yeah. I just watched a movie that has that exactly called Jack Reacher where they have like a scene similar to that in the very beginning. And I'm just like, wow, I wonder if they stole that from this. Oh, Christopher McQuarrie is a huge John Carpenter fan. Oh, really? Okay. I think he jacked it. (laughs) I think everybody who makes action movies has seen this movie at one point. I would imagine so. It looks like a blueprint for like a perfect siege or action movie like this. I did really appreciate and found it really shocking and actually got like intakes of breath stuff. People just die. Yeah. They just die. That's actually a good of mine. Oh, yeah. Lead up. There's no warning. All of a sudden. There's no speech. Yep. Yep. They just get iced. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not gross either. It's not like, you know, I think we should go out for cupcakes. Face gone. Yeah. They have a task. Yep. And the task is cut short. And you can't believe how many people of them die. Like, how many of them go? There are 59 deaths in this movie. Wow. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. I know even the ones that we focus on. Like, I mean, I think the one who takes the longest to die is the one officer who goes down. And that's just because he has a couple of twitches. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Kathy, you know, the little girl, she takes it. She's just staring and she drops. Yep. Poor Kathy with a K. Aww. <laughs> that was funny was she enjoyed getting hit with the blood spat so much, which came out of the ice cream cone. They had an air bladder in there <laughs> that she was like, can we do that again? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a nice story. I think Julie dies off camera. Yeah, she does. Yeah. Yeah, R.I.P. Julie. <laughs> that was my last note. I think my two last notes were, people just die, and Lee is the best. <laughs> and this is one thing that kind of became a problem with Carpenter as we moved into the video era of Pan and Scan, was this was his first film shot in anamorphic, the really wide, widescreen format, and he just fell in love with it, and almost all of his films after this are going to be anamorphic, and man, does he use the frame well. Mm. He knows how to use a lot of empty space, just kind of have someone off to the side and a lot of empty space alongside him. Like, it all looks like every still would be a good picture. It's so clean. Yeah. Yeah. I know this is um, probably a silly question, but do you guys know, is John Carpenter a nice man? I, well, I've never met him. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, you hear things. I mean, he's never killed anyone, but what I hear in interviews, he's kind of a lot like Napoleon Wilson. Oh, he's kind of like acerbic and... Uh, like stoic? If someone's kind of being an asshole, he'll kind of like take a couple jabs at him, but he'll just kind of be kind of quiet. Mm. He's really good friends with Kurt Russell, so he can Yeah, can't... I mean, and he does a ton of commentaries. Most of his films have audio commentaries. Like, the ones with him and Kurt Russell are hilarious because they're just throwing back a couple of beers and <laughs> laughing their way through them. The Thing commentary is great. He's basically, what if, um, I hate to say it, but what if the lead from the, uh, the short film that we did, The Return of, uh, crap, what was it? Bronco Billy. Bronco Billy, what if that person had kind of gone on to become successful? He's a Western geek. 
<laughs> he loves the old filmmakers and stars of the Western films. He's got that kind of dusty country quality about him, even though he grew up a city kid. He's got the big mustache, too. <laughs> I, know, I don't know whether it's lame or not, but because I'm starting to really like it and really like the stuff that he does, I have to know if he's a good person or not. You know, like if he's a jerk, I would have a really tough time. I think it says a lot that he has had so many people who come back to work with him again and again. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah actually, that makes sense. I think he's a good dude. I've never known him to like be someone who explodes on people. I've never known him to be someone who tears. I mean, like he'll take a jab or two, a sarcastic jab or two, but he never tears anyone down. I would never mark someone for wit. Yeah. Whenever they, someone interviews him about the films that he wrote, but he didn't direct, he says, I, j I won't comment on that because I didn't direct it. Like Eyes of Laura Mars is a film that every time it comes up in an interview, he says, I don't have much to say about that film. I didn't direct it. And that's it. Yeah. And he wrote and directed the thing? Did he he directed it. Yeah. He directed okay. it. Okay. I don't think he wrote it. Well, he, as we get on, he'll have a number of writers that he works with repeatedly that he'll supervise. I could see that because they're very tonally the same, like a lot of his movies. And we'll get into that. If there's a lot of recurring writers, and that's because, you know, he's so enmeshed in pre-production that he's kind of like, here, I'll, I'll go over it with you. Here's basically what we want to do. And they do all the typing. Okay. It's a good angle. I'd do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, what movie are we going to do next? Our movie coming up next is Eyes of Laura Mars. All which right. is uh, around this period, in order to raise money for the films he wanted to make, he started writing a lot of spec scripts. And over the next 20, 30 years of his career, we'll see a bunch of those gradually get made. Eyes of Laura Mars is the first one. All right. It's exciting. I've never, I don't know anything about it, so I'm very excited to watch it. I have never seen it myself. All right. We're in for a, possibly a treat. <laughs> And I will say that between this episode going up and when we do Eyes of Laura Mars, we're going to have the first written review on our blog. Excellent. I have found another spec script called Prey that he wrote around the same time. It was uh, co-written with James Nichols, who was the assistant director and post-production supervisor on Assault on Precinct 13. And I know nothing about this movie. I can't find anything about the production history of it. I don't know what the story is, but I have a copy of the script. I'm going to read it and I'll write a review for the site. Cool. Great. That's awesome. So, final thoughts on Assault on Precinct 13? Lee. It's awesome. Assault on Precinct! Awesome! We had a lot to say about it, but I was worried that it was just going to be us being like, yeah, that's great, that's great, that's cool, man. But well, I, I specifically, Ali, of course, has seen it, and I asked him not to tell me anything because he started to tell me the plot. Because it's actually really nice because I don't know anything to just watch it fresh. It's a good movie to go into fresh. It's a good movie to just let unfold. Yeah. And I know it was good because we didn't talk. Yeah. Like, we were literally silent through the whole thing except to say, that's awesome. I like that. <laughs> we are both very chatty when we watch movies. We are both not the best people to watch movies with. That's why <laughs> you we're married. <laughs> it's fine. I, I understand fear code. Yeah. But at home, yeah, we're going to chat. Yeah. We're... And we were pretty quiet through the whole thing because yeah. we were, I knew, like, definitely it was awesome because we both got closer and closer to the screen. <laughs> like, we watched it on our laptop until we were both hunched over as close to the screen as possible and silent. Yeah. <laughs> Just from the tension and how good it was. Good viewing experience. Even mm -hmm. our infant daughter was enraptured. She was. Him. She watched, she ate her dinner. She loves action. She's yeah. really into action stuff. Her first words will be, gotta smoke? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor pie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I also want to, again, remind people that I'm not really going to be doing anything for this site when it comes to the remake of Assault on Precinct 13, because I kind of already covered it two years ago in an episode of I Hate Love Remakes. I hate love remakes .blogspot.com. I'll link to the specific episode in the show notes. We get into the film in a lot of detail there, so I'm just going to kind of let that episode be where we cover that specific remake. Check that podcast out. It's much better than us, and I think we're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I will just say that I like the remake. I don't think it's a great movie. I don't think it's nearly as good as this film, but I think it's still a good entertaining movie, and I kind of like the different spin it has, because the big twist is that instead of gangsters getting in, it's cops attacking cops. Mm -hmm. because it's corrupt police trying to break into a police station where they hold a mob boss who is about to testify on all the corrupt cops. That twist works better at this day. So it's like, what if you take all the resources of a modern, fully outfitted police department and attack a single, rundown, abandoned police station all at once? I don't need to rewatch this. Not a great film, but it's a great setup, and I, I like the movie. I think it's like Ethan Hawke in it, Lawrence Fishburne. Lawrence Gideon Fishburne, Park. Brian Dennehy, Maria Bello. Yeah. I like all those people. Yeah, we can check that out. Okay. I hope you guys enjoy it when you watch it again. I've already discussed it. I enjoy it. I'll watch it again myself, probably just because. Mm -hmm. If I get it, that's one of those Blu-rays that's hard to get my player to play. So. Oh, really? I will say that I'm having a really good time. 
Me too. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like, it's tough because I was kind of unsure what it was going to be like and if I would actually really like the movies you were watching or if I was going to be like this cranky bitch. <laughs> like, this is stupid. What's great about Assault on Precinct 13 is it is probably the best litmus test you can have for people whether or not they like John Carpenter's style. Yeah. I think I might like it. Yeah, I think you're going to be down with it. I think you passed that test with flying colors. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, he has a very specific look that not everyone loves. The way he draws out tension, some people don't click with it very well. I have a friend who just can't stand his films because of how slow they are. Mm. For me, I love it. I love the tension. I love the atmosphere. I love the style. Yeah, I love that it's dark and spare. It's very, yeah. And Julia, welcome along for the ride. Yay! (laughs) This is everything you got here is pretty much representative of what you're going to be covering for the next four years. There you go. Well, then that's a definite plus. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I think that brings our episode to a close, unless you guys have anything else you want to add? No, I think we covered it. I think so. Looking forward to the next one. Okay, and we'll see everyone back here again next month for Eyes of Laura Mars. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Masters of Carpentry is a Made of Fail production. Madeoffail.net. We were unpopular before it was cool. And genuinely, Julia, I'm glad you enjoyed the movie. Oh, thanks so much. One of my favorites. Really pleased. I knew you'd like it. I actually am going to put it in one of my favorite lists as well. I will watch that many times over again. Yeah, it's pretty perfect. And I think they said that one of the reasons why it wasn't very successful when it first came out in the U.S. was just because Americans were so tired of Westerns by that point, and it was such a Western. Some of those films go under the radar, and I have no idea why. There's a film coming out that I know is going to be like that that's already out, and I think it already tanked, called You're Next. And I think it's going to be like a film like this where people are like will discover it on video or on demand or whatever and fall in love with it. And this is also very much The Raid, The Redemption. Yeah, definitely. Very what? much uh, The Raid, Redemption. What's that? It's the Korean film directed by the British guy that I watched on Netflix with their fighting their way up the building. Oh, yeah. It's like sort of like Dread. The Raid is almost kind of the inverse of Assault on Precinct 13. Yeah, very much so. It's where you, they have to penetrate a building full of gang members and it's pure action nonstop. Yeah, and they both work in their different ways. <laughs> I think Dread works a little better than Raid, but Raid is really good. I preferred Dread, but I did enjoy Raid as well. I think my only problem with Raid is it's so relentless that it can get a little tiring after a while. It's sort of like... um, Especially when it suddenly just becomes martial arts battles. Yeah, it's sort of like they're rage zombies. They're not like actual criminals. And they're like, every action moment in that is so beautifully choreographed. It's just piling so many on top of one another. You need a chance to breathe. Yeah, that's the problem with the raid is it doesn't always give you a chance to breathe. And then the whole story of the two brothers got a little bit much. But it's still a really good movie. Yeah, it's like Jackie Chan films. There's like the best scene you've ever seen, then a bunch of bullshit. And then by the time you're ready for the next scene, there it is. <laughs> I had a really big Jackie Chan phase, actually. Yeah? And it was pretty great. Oh, yeah, Jackie Chan films are great. I love them. The ones from the 80s was, the 80s and the early 90s was his best period where Definitely. it was, let's craft a magnificent set piece that no one's ever seen before. And then how can we build a story that will take us there? Like that rope factory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you guys ever seen City Hunter? <laughs> City Is that the one on the boat? Yes. Yeah, yeah, love City Hunter. That's like an anime come to life. <laughs> and it was. It was based on a Japanese anime. City Hunter! <laughs> exactly. Da-da-da-da. Yeah. Da, 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 da. You guys are the first people I know who've ever actually seen City Hunter. God. Well, we Nobody went, else has ever seen that movie. Well, one of my birthday parties was a Jackie Chan marathon. We did City Hunter. Uh, what was it called? Me- Wheels on Meals? Oh, that has one of the best fight scenes ever with filmed. The, the little guy, the little uh, kickboxing guy. Yeah, Benny the Jet or Yeah, that is one that of the That one best. fight between, it's just two guys in a room hitting each other. And it's is that the, the one that blew, blew Natalie's mind? Yeah, that one. Yeah. That's the Our best fight Natalie, scene I think I've ever like, seen in my life. And that is considered to be one of the best fight sequences ever made. It's, it it's incredible. The rest of the movie so-so, but that scene, oh.
whenever I see that scene, I'm like, if you ever make another Daredevil movie, I just want it to be all that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why Sammo Hung, they kept trying to make him a star, but Sammo Hung is just so much better as a director and choreographer. Yeah, I could see that. He's great at popping up in supporting roles, too, but he's, he's just... comic relief. I mean, when we brought him over here for martial law, that's four years he could have been doing fight scenes in Hong Kong. That's true, yeah. I think they had three guys, came, like Jackie Chan, him, and there's another guy that came up together. Yeah. Yeah, they all came up together at the Peking Chinese Opera School. Or something. And then they... Uh, and kept... Sammo Hung did a film called Peking Opera Blues, which was about their childhood. Oh, very nice. Is it depressing? Because <laughs> it sounds like they had a Yes, because the reason why they're able to do what they do is because the Peking Opera School basically tortures kids into becoming Cirque du Soleil performers. Yeah, and they become like superhuman. It's the most grueling, horrific body training and sculpting from childhood. And they're basically sold to the school. Yeah. The school then owns them until they become adults. Exactly. And then he became like, just like an extra, right? Like a stunt guy. Uh, no, actually, I think they both came up here because they were both in Enter the Dragon at the same time. Yeah, Jackie Chan got kicked out a window, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> no, no, Jackie Chan got his nice big close-up of Bruce Lee holding his head and then snapping his neck. Oh, he's the guy who gets his neck snapped with the... Yeah. Oh, I gotta yeah, he had a mustache at the time. I gotta rewatch that. And Sammo Hung fought Bruce Lee in, the, in one of the early scenes. Nice. Okay, I'm going to rewatch that. And then Jackie Chan's first movie was, of course, a ripoff sequel of, can't remember, it was, it was one of Bruce Lee's movies. Okay. And then he got Drunken Master and then became a star. Oh, Drunken Master. That choreographer, the, the I can't remember his name. Yin Wu-Ping? This guy. Yeah, he's so good. And the Drunken Master, Snake and Eagle Shadow. Oh, so good. We're entering my junior high right now. There was a local theater where every Friday night at midnight, they would play a Hong Kong film. You are a lucky duck to and have. And my dad and I would go every oh, Friday night. That's like my dream. <laughs> so, I mean, so many of these Jackie Chan films, that was my introduction to like Michelle Yeoh, Jet Li. Got to see a lot of the John Woo stuff. See, we had something like that in Toronto, but by the time I moved to Toronto, like I'm from a smaller town and our theater was just like a rinky-dink theater that just showed new releases. So when I got to Toronto, this is my life because I wanted to see these martial arts films on the big screen. I was a big Wu-Tang Clan fan and like that got me into that whole uh, genre. By the time I got there, the theater that showed them turned into a porno theater. <laughs> Yeah, the Riverview is still around, but yeah, it was only for about a year and a half there that like every Friday night, my dad and I would go. So uh, I got a Chinese uh, ghost story, Once Upon a Time in China, oh, Hard Boiled, yeah. oh, all these great things. That's amazing. You're lucky duck. And I was so pissed off when so many of them came out over here officially, and it was because of the Weinstein brothers. Which they chop everything up. Oh, they chopped the shit out. I mean... Armor of God 2 Operation Condor with Jackie Chan was one of my favorites of his. And when I saw it was coming out in theaters, I had to drag a bunch of my friends to go see it. Because I'm like, this is an amazing film. You'll love it. You'll love it. They cut 28 minutes out. Oh. They cut an entire half hour out of that movie. So and it was talk. horrible and unwatchable. And I had to apologize to my friends. While I'm also just sitting here of like, no, that's gone. That's <laughs> gone. That's gone. And they took all the humor out. They, they just, it was... It's so horrible. I hate the... It's because of that that I can't stand the Weinsteins. I can understand. Here's something you might know. Why is Mortal Kombat, the movie, the plot, Enter the Dragon? <laughs> because they got away with it. Okay. I, I thought as much. Because nobody noticed until it was too late. I'm like, that's Enter the Dragon. That is also Enter the Dragon. And yet, it's actually not a bad adaptation of the game. <laughs> yeah. It basically is, let's just take Enter the Dragon to adapt the game, and it's like, it fits. Yeah, I could see that. Oh, Mortal. I actually watched that again here recently. I saw it again at a party, and it didn't hold up as much, but I kind of enjoyed it the it's same. It's so full of nostalgia, but there was one time when my, when I was watching it in the late 90s and my dad came in and watched part of it with me. He said one thing that I, I one of those moments where it just kind of like shattered my mind, and I'm like, now I can't watch the film without seeing what he pointed out. Every single hit they cut in for a close-up. Oh, really? And I just suddenly realized that they're completely destroying the fight choreography, which is really good fight choreography, because every single hit, every time they make contact with a foot or a face, it cuts into a close-up. My brother and I used to uh, play fight all the time, and then we went and saw Mortal Kombat together in the theater. And as soon as that movie was over, we took our play fighting to a new level <laughs> of real connection. And like we would choreograph these epic martial arts fights. It was wonderful. <laughs> I actually also like Mortal Kombat Annihilation but mostly because I'm charmed by it. It is definitely... It's it's adorable. Mess. <laughs> it's adorable. Yeah, it's really silly. That Motaro outfit, where it's just a guy standing there with, like, clogs pretending to be hooves. And... <laughs> 
Yeah, I didn't see that one in the theater. I'm kind of glad about that one. But when I saw it on the, in the screen, like um, on video, I've read the novelization of that movie. <laughs> of course, you have. 